Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Really excited about our show today. We are talking about the Inquisition on this episode. That's right. No one's going to expect it, but we're going to get into the history of the Inquisition. We're going to look at myths that people believe about the Inquisition as to how many people died, what the purpose of the Inquisition was, and a lot more really interesting things. Well, I'm excited because for the first time, the Inquisition is not with my head on the chopping block, but his. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let's uh, let's dig in here. I'm really excited. We've got again uh, Stephen Weidenkopf with us. Thank you very much for joining us, um, church historian, uh, ad- adjunct professor, <laughs> adjunct, 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 professor. adjunct professor, adjunct professor at Christendom College. Uh, Big professor. shout out goes to Christendom, yeah, what a beautiful right. university. Send yeah, your Virginia. kids there. Yeah. Yeah. Very excellent author. He's written a lot of great books. Mm-hmm. One of his newest is Timeless: The History of the Catholic Church. It's available from our Sunday Visitor and on Amazon. Yes. Yep. Thanks for joining us. Thanks yeah. for having me on the show, guys. So we're talking the Inquisition today. And we talk about it every week. And it's normally with me being asked very, very difficult questions. But to have an episode, just strictly speaking, talking about the Inquisition, I think we'll continue to shed light on what the Inquisition actually is. What does the word mean? Inquisition, mm-hmm. inquire? It, it seems like it would have that sort of relevancy. So, yeah, yeah the Inquisition... Mm-hmm. In the Middle Ages and before, there was, before we have, I guess, the common uh, procedure of law now, you had what was known as the inquisitorial system. Mm -hmm. And the inquisitorial system was a series of questions that would allow a person, a magistrate, or someone who was uh, judging a case, to have a structured way of getting to the facts of a case. And that's where the word comes from. Yeah, in essence. I mean, really, there was a great legal revolution, right, in the 12th century where uh, imperial Roman law was not necessarily rediscovered, but maybe reapplied, and there was more emphasis on it. This is a time, a period where you have the creation of the universities, you have uh, the institution of, of you know learning about the legal system and legal procedure. The great University of Bologna, for example, becomes the premier place to go to be a, either a civil or a canon, a church lawyer in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so Europe kind of moves from what had been this accusatorial procedure which was before the 12th century for a crime, what would happen is you would go before the civil authority and you would accuse someone of committing a crime against you, right? You would go before the judge or your uh, lord and say, oh, my neighbor stole my goat, right? Um, So you accused your neighbor. And then the neighbor would be summoned to go before the lord and he would say, swear an oath and say, I did not you know, steal Steve's goat. And so then that would kind of be almost be the goat, end of it. The you didn't steal my goat. I did. You Maybe pretty further mad. Down. I don't know. <laughs> I am mad about my goat. Mad. Yeah. <laughs> I want my goat bad. My friend's goat. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so he would, you would swear an oath and say, I didn't steal the goat. Well, maybe I would contest that. And so then the only way to solve it would be either the secular Lord would just rule and pass judgment, or you might be asked to undergo an ordeal. You might say, you know, well, we'll fight it out. There'll be, you know, judicial combat over it. Or some other kind of ordeal would happen to prove your innocence. So that's how things kind of were before the 12th century. But once you get into the later 12th century and into the 13th century, then inquisitorial procedure uh, is what's adopted, especially through the church courts uh, and then also into secular courts as well, where you would, again, the state or the secular ruler would go out and investigate a crime. They would hear something had happened. They would go investigate. They would take witnesses. They take testimony rather from witnesses. And then you would collect this evidence, and in a court of law, you would have judges or investigators, inquisitors asking questions back and forth to try to then elicit the truth. Is yeah. In that time, what were uh, were people considered innocent until proven guilty? Is that where that well, maybe actually, came from? Or? The, the first time, so the idea of guilt, um, innocent and proven until proven guilty, goes back to Roman times. But the first time that it was really formulated in the modern Western world was in 1250 by a Cardinal Johannes Monachus. And he said that a uh, proof lies with him who asserts and not on he who denies. And the basis of this uh, legal concept comes from the fact that even God himself, when he, God knows all things in the garden of Eden, when he says, 
did you eat from the apple? He still had an inquisition of Adam and still gave him a due process and still gave him a trial to allow him to respond to an accusation. So this cardinal uh, said that even if God would uh, pres- allow somebody to defend their innocence, so should the church. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the inquisition was like an investigative thing and the courts would apply an investigator through the It was a courts, process. Was a, the, right. in, the inquisition was a process, just like now you have cross examinations and sure. examinations. Mm-hmm. This was essentially the legal process for um, determining the, uh, the guilt of a person, mm-hmm. right? This was not, you know, I think the concept now is the inquisition is the, like almost like a religious order, like a, a group of people would come in and sneak up and torture people. But it wasn't, this was a very structured and, um, it's usually it's usually you know seen as some kind of like thought control organization, right? That the church had this this malicious uh, you know omnipotent body of individuals, right? Clerics that would squash free thought and squash you know people's religious liberty and those kinds of things, yeah. and and was actively seeking out people and and attacking Harming them. Muslims and Jews and burning people left and right and these kinds of. I mean that's the modern image of the Inquisition uh, that, you know, comes to us a lot from some Enlightenment thinkers back in the 16th and 17th century who were anti-Christian, they're anti-Catholic in particular, and they want to lessen the influence of the church and society. So they take these historical examples. We talked about the Crusades, they use the Inquisition, and they kind of concoct this false narrative that I call about these historical events to discredit the church. And so, I mean, what, what, you know, kind of gauges the mind or stirs the mind more than this, like, you know, secret hooded group of individuals, you know, sinisterly going around and controlling people's thoughts. I mean, that really preys upon fear that, you know, we have of government even or of authority in the modern world. And so these yeah. myths just perpetuate over and over again. And they the historical reality, which we'll get into is far from uh, this myth that's painted. Where do you learn most? Where, as a historian, what where do you learn the most about the Inquisition period? Is it church documents? Is it you know historians of that age? Yeah, it's both. I mean, there's there's a lot of church documents, papal pronouncements that were put together as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the records of the the inquisitions themselves. So mm-hmm. all of these tr- institutional tribunals, as well as the medieval inquisitors. Uh, in the 13th century, took very meticulous notes. You know, gotcha. they had scribes, they wrote down everything, the investigation, the questions they asked alleged heretics were all written down. Um, you know, Joan of Arc, for example, is one of the greatest examples of this. When she was brought before illegally, you know, an inquisition, yeah. her trial, I mean, we have word for word practically what was said wow. and what she was asked and how she answered it. So you have those documents, so you can mine those documents and, and read them. Uh, and uh, and be able to you know come up with the historical reality, which is yeah. again vastly different from the narrative, false yeah. narrative. So when did the Inquisition, as maybe not as moderns understand it, as this you know overarching uh, cons- you know thought control system, but a more structured church sponsored Inquisition um, come about? What were the what were the um, I guess the events that led to that becoming a, a, a structural thing. Like because because yeah. even I'm, I'm even thinking of the time of, of St. Francis that, you know, the people that were experiencing injustices, they would go to the local bishop mm-hmm. to execute some amount of judgment. Right. So the juridic process must have given rise to this absolute need mm-hmm. and this step that would progress, you know, us along the process of, of, you know, justice. Right. Yeah. So really it's like, in, it's towards the end of the 12th century. So in 1184, Pope Lucius the third is the one who first sends out a list of heresies uh, to the bishops of the world and, and, and empowers them really to, in, to be the investigators of heresy in their areas. What were some of these heresies? So, well, for the biggest one in the South of France was Albigensianism or Catharism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is a, a Gnostic based kind of dualist heresy that believed that matter was evil and spiritual things are good. Um, not, uh, Albigensians, for example, denied the incarnation, you know, Jesus only appeared human because material things are are evil or bad. They're they're really trying to answer the question, why does evil exist? Mm -hmm. Right. That's, which is a perennial question, right. That people have had for centuries Mm -hmm. and people wrestle with today, but the, the Manichae or the, um, the Albigensians who were a form of Gnosticism, a form of, form of Manichaeanism, which were earlier church, uh, history heresies, early heresies in church history. They answered that question by centering evil in matter. Material things are bad, right? Matter, our bodies make us do bad things. They were, it was created by an evil God. So everything material is bad. 
Uh, so that's why they deny the incarnation of this and that. But, but what they kind of come to forefront in the south of France, for a lot of different reasons, the south of France is not as politically united. Uh, the king of France is very weak in the south. He doesn't have a lot of authority or power. There's a lot of independent towns. Uh, the church, the state of the church, as we get into the, the 12th and 13th century in the, in the south of France, is really bad. You have priests that are malformed. They're not living their vocation authentically. They're not living the vow uh, or the promise of celibacy well. And so they, but then you have these Abigensians who seemingly are presenting this kind of perfect lifestyle. They're they're living their, what they're teaching. Uh, they're practicing what they preach, we would say. And so there's a there is a kind of a sense of holiness about them, right? They're very they live a very aesthetical lifestyle. They're fasting. They're pre- performing penance all the time, and so people are really drawn more towards that because holiness. Getting images of attracts. like the Quakers almost, yeah, like in, in a certain sense, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> either you know, a group set apart and they're different from this Catholic clergy, radically so, and so people are attracted more to that than the church, uh, and so it begins to be it begins to spread mm-hmm. rapidly, and so the church has to deal with this and. And really, before you get into this period of the 12th and 13th century, the church really had previously looked upon secular rulers to be the ones who would kind of look at and uh, investigate heresy in their areas. Because and this is a key thing that Catholics, I think, misunderstand or don't keep in mind when we talk about the Inquisition, is that heresy in the medieval world and the early modern world was not only a church crime— it was a crime against the church, right, with, a, with an ecclesiastical penalty associated with it. Which would have been suppression and excommunication. Excommunication, right. Mm. And then, but also, right, which is even more important, heresy was seen as a secular crime as well. So the secular authorities punished heresy from a civil perspective. Because, because heresy specifically um, theologically related or were heresies like, you know, you're not following the emperor, you're not doing something that the king no, wants. No, they were theolo- right. yeah, theological. Yeah, theological based. Theological. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, heresy is, you know, then and now it's the for, it's defined as a, a, you know, obstinate post-baptismal denial of a basic doctrine of faith. Gotcha. Right. That's what heresy mm-hmm. is. And so, um, but for the rulers at the yeah. time, having a unified, uh, without the lack of modern infrastructure and, and governmental techniques, having a unified people based on a common creed and a common, uh, a, a common culture made managing these large uh, disparate areas and disparate peoples manageable. So it would it really made sense for a secular king or ruler to use the unity that a, a common religion would provide as a way to keep a, a peoples together. Mm-hmm. So that's why in that context, that heresy is really going against the unity of uh, of civil society. That's why... The church, if you were a heretic, excommunication or suppression or at terrible times, imprisonment of maybe a higher cleric. Mm. But the government, they would treat it as a almost um, it was a treasonable it's, offense. It's a treason, treason. exactly. It was, yeah, it was a treasonable offense. So it was a capital offense. It was so the penalty on, from the secular perspective, the secular uh, courts for heresy was death. Right. Right. So it's it's when we see these images of, you know, people being burned at the stake as being heretics, people always associate that with the church, which is not true. It's actually against canon law to it, to impose the death penalty. The church had no ability, no legal authority whatsoever to impose a death penalty on anyone. Uh, so what would the church would do is after this period, and we can get into this, I guess, in terms of the procedure of after the period of time of inquisitorial procedure where the heretic was asked over a, you know, over a period of time about their heresy were given multiple opportunities to recant and repent and return to the church. If they refused to do so, then the church had no recourse really than to just say, well, you're obstinate in your heresy. We can no longer help you. You know, you are now remanded to the state. And then the state would then prosecute the heretic. And then if so determined to be guilty would then, you know, inflict the death penalty. Mm-hmm. What, what are we talking about? Space and time, we're talking in, in southern France? I mean, is that where... This is where it kind of begins, south oh, of yeah, France it, in the 12th, began there. late 12th, early 13th okay. century, and then it, then it will... So from the 13th century up until about the 15th century, you have what are known as papal inquisitors. So these are itinerant, yeah. um, trained clerics, yeah. usually Dominicans, uh, who who were the order was really founded kind of to combat this issue in the south yeah. of France by Saint Saint Dominic, um, but they would they'll, they're itinerant so they go around to different areas where there might be heresy present. There's no real institutional tribunal that comes later in the 15th century where you have throughout Christendom in major urban areas 
especially in Spain, you have the institution or the creation of institutional tribunals where they, yeah. the inquisitors are in one particular city. <clears throat> they don't move around. Cases are brought to them rather than them going out to the areas yeah. and that kind of thing. And we still do this because, I mean, in yeah. my seminary, we had an, an inquisition of sorts. It was— uh, In which you failed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was actually during a hurricane. I met with, <laughs> I met with, a, guy, I met with a guy during a Category 2 hurricane. In, in, in my seminary, but but yeah, it was what called apostolic. <laughs> was well, that, that was actually the, one of the trials by combat. They oh, said, yeah. "Go stand outside. <laughs> if you don't get blown over, you're innocent." Here, here. Uh, he fell over. He He's married gone. six He's kids. Yeah, it, yeah. it was called yeah. an apostolic visitation. I think that's what it was, it was, okay, it was yeah. called. Mm-hmm. And, and they're just inquiring about the education State that's of being the done. Seminary. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So how does the mm-hmm. how do these itinerant and papal inquisitors go to that more established um, institution of inquisition? And I think in the minds of most, the Spanish Inquisition, but there was also the English and the French. And, right. Uh, but how do, how do those uh, take rise? Yeah, well, the institutional chart, so as you move forward through the centuries, you have a more consolidation by secular rulers of the power that they have within their own nations, right, within their own territory. So this is before the rise of the nation state and, you know, all kinds of democratic uh, governments and things like that. So you move from medieval kings who are really kind of the first lord among lords, you know, a Mm -hmm. powerful lord, but not someone who's an absolute ruler. And as you're moving forward into history, as you get into the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s, you begin to see the consolidation of royal power in these various European countries. You begin to see the rise, especially in France in the 17th century, of the absolutist monarch uh, like Louis XIV and these who are, who are controlling pretty much all aspects of, of their society, not only civilly speaking, but also the church. Right? Many of these, these kings, as they drive towards absolutism, they want to control the church and their territories as well. As well. And so in some areas, in some cases, that proves to be a conflict between the ruler and the church. In other cases, the church almost is in, in kind of cahoots in a certain mm-hmm. sense, or church rulers, I should say. Are like really Avignon or with the Holy Roman right, Emperor. Right, or Cardinal mm-hmm. Richelieu later on yeah. in the 17th century, who's you know, a minister of state, right, or yeah. for the French king. So, oh, your boy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, uh, he, I never heard him described that way before. Uh, that's pretty good. Well, yeah. only, but only someone who's his boy would describe him that way. That's true. That's yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> so, you have this movement of, so as these kings gain more and more power, they want to kind of have an institutional tribunal that's kind of beholden to them that the Pope has granted authority for them to to utilize in their kingdoms to address certain major issues of heresy and of national security as the situation was in Spain. Now, in Spain, I think the context would be the Reconquista, right? right? Uh, Reconquista. That was... Reconquista. Conquista, Quista. (laughs) What's your name? Yeah. (laughs) Isn't... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) The Reconquista, where... um, (laughs) Spain had been uh, taken back from the Moors. Right. And there is, again, the society that has a lot of fractionality. Mm -hmm. And again, to make the society something that is governable, um, that is when the Spanish Inquisition really comes into a very prominent position because you had uh, a confluence of Catholics, uh, Moorish Muslims, and then uh, Sephardic Jews. Right. And this is a, there's a lot of uh, opposing societal currents and having having an inquisition there was but Ferdinand and Isabella, right? Exactly. Yeah. So in 1469, right, Isabel and Ferdinand uh, Fernando marry and they un- you know unify the kingdom the two different kingdoms of Spain, right? The kingdom of Castile and kingdom of Aragon are now formed into the kingdom of Spain. And so as you mentioned, right, Spain is unique in other as as opposed to other parts of Christendom at the time because of the the three different, you know, major religious groups there and have had a, a centuries of history there. Uh, and so there arose in Spain this, this kind of societal problem or this issue with a group of people known as the conversos. And the conversos were, in essence, Spanish Muslims and Jews who had converted to the Christian faith. But you had, so you have that group, and then you have these old, they, they were called old Christians, right? Spanish families who had been Christian lived in you know, Spain for centuries. And so these old Christian families begin to see the rise of some of these conversos who rise to prominent positions in secular government, rise to prominent positions in the church. And there's so there's some jealousy going on among certain families in certain areas. And then so many of these old Christians began to believe in conspiracy theories that, you know, well, maybe they're not really Christian. Maybe Mm -hmm. behind the scenes, they publicly they say they're Christian, but 
privately in their home, they're still following Jewish um, dietary practices or, mm -hmm. or they're still Muslim and they're still praying to Mecca five times a day or these kinds of things, right, towards Mecca. So you have uh, this, this kind of fear that erupts among the Spanish peoples of these conversos. Uh, and so it becomes a national security issue where this, this kind of conspiracy theory and social angst bubbles up to the, to the king and queen, and they want to ensure that there is unity in Spain. They want religious unity. They want a cultural unity. Um, and, you know, they want to kind of make sure there is no real fifth element, right? There's no fifth column, so to speak, that's hiding in the wings that, because you still have in the south of France in Granada, you have a uh, Muslim stronghold, which doesn't fall until 1492. Mm -hmm. So there's still, and there's still large groups of Muslims and Jews in the, in Spain. And there's a fear among the people that, you know, if there was a Muslim army to come again from Africa, that, you know, maybe these conversos would, who are secretly, supposedly secretly Muslim, but outwardly Christian, they might let them back into the cities and, and cause the downfall of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So this causes the king and queen to ask the Pope, Sixtus IV, to grant the authority for them to open an institutional tribunal, which became known as the Spanish Inquisition, to then address this issue of the conversos to see whether or not they these converted Jews and Muslims were actually really Christian. So why does the Spanish Inquisition in particular get such a bad rap? Well, uh, many different reasons for that, right? So you have in the, when you, into the 16th century, when you have the rise of the Protestant Revolution, uh, you have uh, many who are uh, trying to discredit the church and are trying to, um, to, especially Spain. So Spain in the 16th century is very important, very powerful nation, right? The, you have uh, Charles I, who's king of Spain. He's also Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. So the Habsburg family controls large areas of Western Christendom at the time. And so you have certain nations like France and England that are at odds with Spain. Spanish Netherlands. Spanish Netherlands yep. at the time is a big issue, right? So the large swaths mm -hmm. of what is today, you know, the Netherlands, Belgium, Holland, are all con controlled territory by the Spanish crown. And so these other nation states, even though they might be Catholic like France, um, England for a time until you get to Henry VIII, they have um, political concerns with how powerful this this the Habsburgs are. Mm -hmm. And so there's this kind of legend that that create, is created from many of these Protestant revolutionaries that want to discredit the Catholics and especially credit the ha discredit the Habsburgs, where you have this, it's called the black legend, where you mm -hmm. have this these myths that are associated with Spain and with the Catholic Church in particular that arise. And so that's where you have um, the rise of this myth of the Spanish Inquisition, this evil, omnipotent, um, you know, uh, group of, of individuals that are trying to control all of religious thought and, and all peoples in Spain. So I think maybe Dr. the most evil doctor. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's interesting that you say that probably the most famous inquisitor um, was of the Spanish inquisition. And that was Torquemada. Torquemada right. Uh, now Torquemada, pretty interesting historical character. Do you want to talk about him a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, he's, he was the first inquisitor general of Spain. Um, and so he was, he kind of set the procedures for the Spanish inquisition, how it would operate. Uh, very closely aligned with the king and queen, uh, in particular King Fernando. And so he was an individual that that wanted to, he saw the the Inquisition in Spain as kind of an arm of the of the king, right, of, of the royal power. And so it was a way in which, especially in the cities of Spain, to kind of consolidate the power of the king. Because you have in Spain, the beginning of this time in the 15th century, you have the rise of, of this merchant class of, of, you know, major urban areas, a lot of economic prosperity in Spain as well, um, especially once you get into the latter 15th century into the 16th century with the wealth of the new world coming into Spain. So he uses really the Inquisition as an organ of the state in order to try to consolidate royal power throughout the, the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before we get uh, a little bit further, I'd like to go ahead and, and um, give a shout out to our sponsors. Okay. As a lot of you guys know that um, Patreon is a way to financially support us. Obviously, your prayers are terrific, but uh, we've got a couple of sponsors here that are helping us to fly in our guests and just support us. So we want to share that with you. Exodus 90 is an amazing 90-day uh, uh, men's prayer fasting. Uh, it's very challenging. You do it with your friends hold each other accountable. But on the other side of that thing is a lot of freedom and a lot of joy and a lot of um, peace, you know, and, and we've been hearing that from a lot of the people that have participated in it. Thousands and thousands of men have done this. Um, it's, it's far reaching. It's growing really fast. Um, highly encourage you guys check out uh, exodus90.com. There's an app 
a lot of preparation tools you can use uh, to to start your fast, but uh, definitely do it with you know some friends. It's it's really important. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is Covenant Eyes. Uh, Covenant Eyes has been around for a, a long time. They are an accountability program. If you're struggling with pornography, uh, it, it literally is the best program that's out there. Um, you know we've been uh, working with them for years. Uh, and you know, they've got great little ad campaigns that have recently come out, um, with some superheroes and things like that. But yeah, if you're struggling with pornography, try it. Uh, it's, it's an accountability partner. They look at, uh, what you're looking at online. Um, a lot of men and women use it. And, and, you know, so if you're struggling with something like that, check out, uh, covenanteyes.com. Yeah. When you go to covenanteyes.com, make sure to use the promo code Catholic talk and you get 30 days free. Yep. Yep. 30 days free, very generous. If, if, I could ask a, if I could ask a question about uh, the sense of authority and the consolidation of power and almost uh, the desire for authority to uh, promote a type of ideology that would create a sense of solidarity. Mm-hmm. Th- that all makes sense. It, it, it completely, uh, you know, for me personally, I look to the magisterium. I look to my superiors. I look to the elders of the faith. I look to the history books because I do want to govern my thought in that in that unified form. So the rebellion against that type of uh, you know action of the juridic nature of what we're talking about. You know, what's your thought process on the overall process of of, of kind of a rebellion against authority? Mm-hmm. And uh, could you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's well, you put it very well, Father. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why secular rulers were so concerned about heresy. I mean, that's mm-hmm. one of the questions I get a lot when I go and give talks, you know, in parishes about the Inquisition is, well, why would secular rulers care, right? Mm-hmm. Because we, it's so hard for us in modernity to understand a, an idea, a worldview where a ruler, a secular ruler would want his society or people in his society to be united in faith, to be mm-hmm. united in, in culture. Um, and especially in the United States, because we come from a, a culture that's that's you know multifaceted, that's uh, you know religious pluralism, and so it, you know what we fail to realize is because we don't really know our history that well in America, sadly, is that this notion of a religious plur- plurality of of multiple religions existing kind of peacefully, uh, you know, in uh, in a society is is a relatively new mm-hmm. human. Endeavor. So the bumper stickers weren't back in the, the 60th century. Yes, uh-huh. so the coexist <laughs> bumper stickers. No, that was, yeah. yeah. Torquemada would be walking down the street. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cruising by in your buggy, he sees a off. coexisting. He's yeah. like, hmm, interesting. Uh, yes. <laughs> you might, you might receive Take a his name down. Some Dominicans, yeah. Do <laughs> <laughs> so you have that bumper sticker? But yeah, so that's a new, it's a relatively <laughs> new idea in human history, really, well, when you think yeah. about it, uh, historically speaking. And, and why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because. If you trace the history of, of heresy in particular through the church's 2,000-year history, that heresy breeds violence, right? Because mm-hmm. the heretic rebels not only against church doctrine, but, but there's usually a social or a civil component to the heresy as well. Mm-hmm. It challenges the divine or what, what, again, medieval people believe was the divine order of how society should be structured, that you have the church, you have secular rulers, you have kings, and they are really representatives. I mean, the king is the representative of... Christ the King, right? Who's Lord of the world. And so, and obviously the Pope is the vicar of Christ, right? Christ's representative mm-hmm. on earth. So to to challenge the doctrine, to to uh, challenge the foundational structures of society breeds violence. Like mm-hmm. that would be like the 30 years war in the Holy Roman exactly. Empire that you had uh, Protestant revolution and then you had different... Uh, dukes taking different sides. Yeah. And because of that, they were all like, well, if I can take this side and I can move my chips on to the Protestant side, I might come out on the other side of this war with more territory. Mm-hmm. I think in general, most of them, it was a very callous decision to be one or the other. I mean, you'll have like the King of France, uh, Henry the fourth. First, he was a, a, a Protestant, mm-hmm. but then he couldn't assume the crown. Then he went back to Protestant because he wanted to be because his mother was, and then he was politically expedient to become a Catholic. So a lot of these rulers at the time were using religion really as a political tool. And that's, and, and, and I think there that's is, what they do today. it's still, it's yeah, still it there. Today. It's still there today. Yeah. And there's a lot of validity to some of the, and, and the, I guess, ill feelings towards the way people behave then, particularly in people in power, Sure, that they were abusing faith to be able to control people. Um, but I don't think true faith and the faith of 
in the Eucharist and in, in the teachings and the gospel were ever instigating these types of things. Mm-hmm. You, these are abuses. And if yeah. it had been, you'll see this in the same thing in uh, Islamic countries. You'll see this in countries um, where it's it's Hindu or Buddhist. It doesn't matter. People will always find these divisions in faith or society to be able to jockey for position. Mm-hmm. It's not something inherent to Christianity. It's not even something inherent to faith. You'll see the same thing in communist or officially atheist countries where a particular strand or political party or a group within that will use, uh, I guess, divisions between the general populace to acquire more power. It's happening this, in our country. It is. You know? And I think this conversation is is pointing in the direction of this concept that it's because of religions and this plurality that's occurring in the why there is so much bloodshed, why there is so much death, why, you know, and, and you could see where people can develop this type of concept and what we're talking about. But I think what you both are sharing is really looking at the lens of what is the state of society and what is the state of the governing powers of the world and how they're trying to address something that is admirable and virtuous, namely a sense of unity and solidarity with with its people. Yeah. yeah, and just think how different, you know, society is when you see the civil government as a ref- or the civil government is supposed to be seen as a reflection mm-hmm. of the the you know, the authority and power of God mm-hmm. and of Christ, mm-hmm. right? That if the secular ruler, you know, however whatever form of government that takes actually sees themselves as, you know, representatives of the kingly power of Christ on earth and and is supposed to exercise that authority for the good, the common good of people, uh, then wouldn't the world be a bit different, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of, as you point out, Ryan, that, you know, so much, so often because of the fall, right, you have people that see, uh, you know, political uh, you know, governments and structures as a way to gain power and to control other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's exactly not what the Inquisition did or the secular rulers were doing at the time, right? They were concerned about charity. They were con- love. They were concerned about the society, the unity of their their uh, their group. And, their to be, and to be perfectly clear, they were concerned about the proper application of the faith. And in in our world today, the idea of telling someone else that the way you're practicing your faith is wrong is just so, that's just not good party manners. You don't mm-hmm. do that, but it matters. And mm-hmm. the ability to have somebody who is the real arbiter of the proper praxis makes sense. And in that time and age, that would not have been a curious thing at all. But in today's world, if I tell you, well, eh, I don't agree with your religion, that is, I mean, there's very few things that you can say are worse. Well, we've, we've grown up with the sense of we don't talk about, you know, religion or politics. And well, what else is interesting? And, and but what else is <laughs> yeah. more important than that? I mean, there, it's, there's, it's, it's the most important uh, dynamics and, and, and principles of living are rooted in these two things. Yeah. How are you going to live here? And then how are you going to live yeah. there? And when it comes to like a subjective religion where this is my, my personal relationship with God and you have nothing to say about it, that's just a very dangerous place to be. I need to welcome criticism. I need to welcome other ideologies and perspectives and be colored in by various experts in various fields of, of mm-hmm. inquiry and inquisition because I, I am not the omniscient corner of my universe. You know, Del Cross and I went to a bar a few weeks ago. Not go surprised. F- go figure. Yeah, that's and a lot of good, listeners that's are good surprised. Story and, and I ran into some, oh, here we go again. <laughs> and I ran into some friends that I knew um, from high school. And they're like, oh, you got this Catholic talk show thing. You know, you were a madman back then, but now you're all Catholic and everything. They're like, but you don't really believe that. I mean, you don't really think that everyone should be Catholic, do you? And I'm like... They're like, well, we're, I, don't, I kind of believe everything's fine. I'm kind of like a pagan or whatever. They're like, do you think I'm wrong? And I can't imagine they would expect me to say, yeah, I think yeah. you're yeah. wrong. Yeah. I think you're wrong. And you know, yeah. I think everybody on earth should be Catholic. And I don't care what anyone says, because if it's good enough for me to believe in, in altruism, if I don't think everyone else should believe it, then why would I believe in myself? If it's only good enough for me and I have no charity, that if I have the tr- this true faith that other people should have that too— that's just selfish and terrible. Mm-hmm. No yeah. faith should be like that. Right. No, and that's and that's exactly right. I mean, that's that's the you know what you said there in terms of charity. I mean, that's the positive aspect of things. Right? So many times people when they study or hear of the Inquisition, they think of it as a negative thing, right? Primarily as we've talked about, because of the false narrative that's presented about this this uh, historical event and this movement and 
But really, it's a positive. It was a positive force in terms of the church is concerned about one's the state of one's soul, mm-hmm. as as we should all be concerned about the state of our soul, right? So the church, as an act of charity, you know, brought the the alleged heretic before the inquisitors in order to help them understand and know what you believe or what you're professing is erroneous. It places your soul in danger. Mm-hmm. And most and of the here's time, the truth. Wouldn't right? most of these heretics, by the time that it got up to that level. They're probably people of a little bit more notoriety. They're probably not going after your average farmer in the countryside. They're probably going for politicians or uh, professors or clerics, people who have influence, right? Because you can't and prosecute are potentially it. leading others um, astray yeah, and right. larger groups of people yeah. astray. Yeah. And these processes, to be addressed. these processes would have been more like a academic debate than they would have been putting people, you know, putting nails under people's fingernails. In some ways, yeah, in some ways. And that's that's true in many cases, especially in Spain, where in Spain, the the Spanish Inquisition was centered in cities, in Mm -hmm. certain cities throughout Spain. So one historian, Henry Kamen, who's kind of the, the, um, you know, the big historian of the Spanish Inquisition in particular, you know, he's estimated that 95% of the Spanish population at the time had no uh, interaction or contact with with an inquisitor. Because 95% of the Spanish society was agrarian, Mm -hmm. lived in the fields, right, in the countryside, not in the city. So it was those who were in the cities who tended to be more educated, who public, more public, or more, you know, a cleric, or they were a merchant or something like that. Now, that wasn't true throughout all different areas. I mean, there are accounts of in Italy, you know, peasants and others that were brought before the Inquisition. So it kind of varies by by area. But in Spain, that's certainly true. Mm -hmm. So one of the big myths is that the Spanish Inquisition or the Inquisitions in general killed millions of people. Um, but that's, that's just not true, is it? No, it's not true. I mean, one, again, Henry Kamen, uh, who I mentioned a minute ago is, is you know, he's researched diligently all the records through the Spanish, uh, archives, the Spanish Inquisition archives. And he's estimated that the height of the Spanish Inquisition from about 1480 to the middle of the 16th century, 1540s or so, 1550s, you had about 2000 people who were remanded to the state from the Inquisition, who were obstinate in their heresy and were then put to death by the state for their heresy. So mm-hmm. of the you know tens of thousands that were brought before, I mean, it, he estimates it's about 5%. Mm-hmm. Or in some, again, in some areas it varies anywhere from 2 to 5% of the cases uh, were ultimately resulted in the death penalty. So we're talking about very, very few numbers as a whole. And you referenced the distinction before that... Uh, there's a distinction between canon law and what the church taught in relationship to what was, you know, the capital punishment of that, of that time. Um, so they were, they were forbidding that they, 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 they were not recommending that. So what was the jump from the secular power after the church and the inquisition recognized that this person is obstinate in their heresy? What was the jump in that secular reality to let's put this person to death now? Now, granted, you could look prior history and and see different actions of of what would lead people to you know their death and or execution. Um, so, can you comment a little bit about that? Like, what? How did this all jump to you know almost a death penalty? Yeah, well, I mean, the state right has has saw heresy as that disruptor of the civil um, unity, right? Mm. Of of uh, a rebel almost really mm. is what a heretic was from a secular perspective. Someone mm. who was challenging the spiritual authority, but also as a result of that, challenging the kingly authority, the secular authority as well. Because as we mm. talked about, the king was seen or the rulers were seen as representing Christ's kingly power on earth. So. Mm-hmm. If you were at odds with the church and the church's teachings you know, and doctrine and refused after, and again, you know, this, this, these trials were not like, you know, five minutes. I mean, we're not, mm-hmm. they weren't like, ten, you know, they were over weeks, months of, of opportunities for the heretic to recant. So what the state saw was if after all that time of the heretic being taught, being instructed, being catechized, being uh, asked to recant, um, even in, in some cases, there may have been, and we can talk about this in a minute in more detail in terms of torture, whether torture was used or not, a um, lot of things associated with that too. But um, the state would then see if after all of that, right, this person is still obstinate in their heresy and still a threat, then they're a threat. They're an active threat the to only reason the that civil that, authority. The only reason a person would maintain that is because they had some kind of agenda, they wouldn't maintain it under that long of a, a process unless that their agenda was societal change right. specifically. Right. Um, do you think there's any maybe parallels with maybe McCarthyism in the 50s or like the idea that 
there's people who are necessarily unpatriotic and that you know in the 50s McCarthyism is communism and they were contrary to the American way of life and there was governmental oh, hearings oh to you, you don't even have out. to go i mean look at today i mean it, it's a, it's an ideological war it's I used know. it's it's literally used to dismantle a civil society yeah there's people I mean, that's exactly what politicians pizza. want they yeah. want you, you to look at the other people. guy as the enemy of course you are <laughs> you're what pineapple on pizza yeah. <laughs> it's tearing yeah. society apart it, it is, is. <laughs> it is a civil disturbance it is it is <laughs> <laughs> ew so you know There wasn't obviously millions of people put right. to death by it. One of the other myths of the Inquisition is that they were putting together women, they were putting women to death as witches. Right. And that the Inquisition was hunting witches with this pre-scientific knowledge and superstition. Right. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, no. And so, the, the I mean, there were, were there cases of of witchcraft that were brought before the various inquisitions. Yes, but there's a huge caveat that only if heresy was also suspected, right? So witchcraft and sorcery in and of itself, up until really the 15th century, the church was really not overly interested in that. They saw it for what it really was. It tended to be peasant superstition, a way to explain, you know, why my crops failed. Oh, that's that old hag down the street that's always complaining about me. She's obviously a witch. You know, that kind of, I mean, that's a peasant superstition. That's not something that the church taught. And the church was, was not involved in those kinds of cases unless then the individual who may have been alleged a sorcerer or witch was also someone who had been spouting heresy or something. Then the Inquisition would get involved. But the vast majority of cases, the Spanish Inquisition in particular, uh, really didn't address the topic at all. And we do have one very impo- uh, kind of celebrated case of an inquisitor going to a regional area, hearing that in the countryside, uh, seven women had been accused of being witches, and the secular authority were going to, was going to put them to death. And the local inquisitor had a kind of agreed with the secular authorities to do this. When word got back to the regional inquisitor, he, as soon as he could, got to the area, removed the local inquisitor for his inappropriate interaction with the secular authorities on this particular issue, and then uh, dismissed the charges against, sadly, five of the seven women had already been killed by the state or by the local authorities, but the other two were released. So you have a specific instance where, you know, the church intervenes and says, this is superstitious, this is not real, Um, you know, there's no heresy involved, you know, let these women go free. Um, really where the witchcraft craze kind of picks up is really during the time of the Enlightenment. I mean, the early stages of the Enlightenment, it's more prevalent in uh, Protestant areas and Catholic areas as well, heavily um, focused in German territories also. Coinciding with the Little Ice Age and the right. and the failure of lots of crops. And, exactly. You know. There's all kinds of other things that are associated with it. So this was never a movement by the church or the Inquisition to do focus on that, although it continues to, to be wrapped up in that whole narrative, false narrative about it as well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It is very mm-hmm. interesting stuff. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and particularly to me, I really love this fact, is that the Inquisition is still here. They just changed their names. Yep. And yep. one of my favorite people of all time... Um, just about 15 years ago, was essentially the Grand Inquisitor of the Catholic Church. You know who that is? Benedict. Mm. He's got a little Papa Benedict. He's got, he's got a bubble head right there. Yeah. Joseph Ratzinger. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. So the Inquisition, the Office of the Inquisition mm-hmm. was, I think, in maybe the 1920s or so, mm-hmm. changed to the Congregation for... It was uh, actually in the 60s after the, Vatican, after the Second Vatican, Vatican Council is when they changed their name, is what I, what I believe. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, Unless, pro- you're probably right. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was after that. But. Between uh, 1908, it was changed to the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office and then right. turned yeah. into the CDF after, after Vatican, Vatican II. Vatican. But in t- before that, up until uh, 1908, it, it was, was still Holy Office the, the Holy Office of the Inquisition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Pope Benedict was the Grand Inquisitor, essentially. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's... he's Damn good at it too. It was good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very and even loving. you know even the CDF now. I mean they they have procedures in place right to look at the writings of theologians that may be suspected of heresy and thing. And many of the procedures that they use today in the modern world were very similar to you know what the church has used for centuries. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyone accused of heresy or having heretical writings uh, is given an opportunity to present their teaching to be asked questions about it, to defend their teaching, uh, to show how they think it might be, uh, you know, uh, in accordance with the faith, and then also be given an opportunity to say, well, no, really, your teachings are not in accordance with the faith, and here's why, Uh, and be given an opportunity to go back and forth 
on that until eventually the church says, okay, well, look, I mean, here's the situation. You know, you have to refute these certain errors in your teachings. If you refuse to do so, that's heresy. You would be obstinate. There are penalties that would be associated with that. But it's, it's a strong people to death, are they? They're not, no, nobody's being remanded to the state. Uh, not for, yet. For, yeah, at least that's what they say. Not that's what they, yet. That's what they yeah. say. They're basically, There's I mean, a secret, secret office. Yeah. Yeah. There's a secret yeah. underground super office. Secret. I think Dan Brown wrote about yes. that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Of course he did. Super <laughs> secret <laughs> office. Yeah. I mean, the punishments now would the be albinos. you can't um, speak at a Catholic university. Right. You teach. can't you yeah. can't teach, mm-hmm. right? Or mm-hmm. you can't publicly celebrate sacraments, things like that. Exactly. Yep. I think that's the last thing that we should talk about with the Inquisition is the matter of torture. Mm-hmm. There's always the the fantastical notion that the Inquisition were torturing people in just incredibly uniquely terrifying ways. Right. Well, I recall an Inquisition that I suffered at your hands, both of you. Uh, I had to eat a cricket. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, so and good. you made me drink the devil's elbow or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> the devil's <laughs> backbone. The devil's backbone. That's funny. Right. Yeah, well, so that, that was, was because torturous. you didn't get the beer right. Yeah. I know, yeah. Because you, 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 you were drinking out of a me. red Solo cup. You hoodwinked me. <laughs> That's why. So is there any truth that the Inquisition were torturing people so, well, again, that's you have to qualify the answer. Um, so was, torture was allowed to be used uh, in the inquisitorial process, uh, but a couple of caveats have to be given with that, right? So uh, we, I mentioned earlier that in 1184 was when kind of the beginnings of the papal inquisi- inquisitors began. Then really it's 1231 when Gregory the Ninth, Pope Gregory the Ninth, really uh, establishes the procedures upon which inquisitors will use in their process. So, but it's not until 1252, so 20 years after that, when torture is actually allowed to be used in the inquisitorial process. So for 20 years, the papal inquisitors operated and worked and used without the process, without, without the use of torture. Now, why the use of torture? Well, uh, if your, your whole point of the judicial process is to elicit a confession, um, then one way in which to elicit that confession would be the physical use of some kind of torture. That was definitely allowed in secular courts. It was widely used in secular church courts. Um, really wasn't a part of, it was not allowed to be used in canonical courts, church courts, until you get to the 1250s and with heresy. And it changes, right, because it was another tool. It really was given to the inquisitors as a tool in their toolbox to either use or not use. It was always optional. Uh, There were many strictures placed and procedures placed around it. It was something that was never done by the church officials themselves. So the inquisitors were not the ones who who performed the actual torture. It was the secular torturer, in essence. Yeah, what kind did. of people? What kind of people were actually carrying out the execution? Would that be like, you know, you say secular powers, mm-hmm. but I mean, is this is this the jailer? Is this soldiers? Yeah, usually it's well, usually a secular lord in particular, you know, a duke or a count or a king would have an actual like in terms of a king would have a royal executioner and that royal executioner would, you know, be the one who implemented the death penalty for secular crimes. He would also be the one who would do the torture as well. So no monks and no priests no, and no monks, Catholic no, clerics were putting anybody to death. Were right? they were they in, in, in some cases trying to eliminate <clears throat> that because of the the Christian faith or were they just like you know, well, we can't stop them. You know what I mean? Like, how, how did that pan well, out? Well, there was, I mean, there was a lot of criticism, right? Yeah. Even within the church of, of allowing the use of torture in inquisitorial <clears throat> procedures. So okay. not everybody agreed with that within the church. Yeah. Uh, and many inquisitors didn't like to use it and didn't use it at all. One of the most famous uh, inquisitor by the name of Bernardo Gui who wrote a manual for how to be a very good inquisitor for his, you know, fellow Dominicans. Uh, and he recommended to not use torture. He, he thought it was not a very effective uh, manner in which to elicit a confession. And so it's important to note that it, when torture was uh, approved for use, first of all, that decision could be appealed by the accused. So it wasn't automatic. Uh, in the Spanish Inquisition, the torture session was regulated to only 15 minutes. It couldn't last any longer than that. Could never involve the loss of limb or the loss of life or any kind of significant uh, you know, damage to the individual. Uh, certain people were exempted from torture. So children, um, I had somebody email me a couple of months ago that somebody had talked with them and said that, you know, oh, I think it was a coworker, a non-Catholic coworker said, well, you know, how can you be Catholic? Because you had monks back in the Inquisition who tortured children. Um, so many things wrong with that simple statement yeah. right there. But one of them is, is children. Children were not, they were exempted from any use of torture. Uh, elderly people, 
uh, certain clerics, knights, uh, others were, were pregnant women, for example. Uh, all these things, you know, were exempted. So there were a lot of procedures put in place. A doctor had to be present as well. All these sessions were, were specifically recorded. Um, and again, it wasn't something that was automatic, and it was always designed as a way to elicit a confession, not as a form of punishment, which is the, the key distinction. Because when we hear that, we all think, again, of these hooded monks just whipping people, um, you know, like Mel Brooks and in, in History yep. of the World Part One kind uh-huh. of thing. So, and that's not what the reality of the situation was at all. I think another thing that's really important to understand about the Inquisitions is that this was not the Catholic Church trying to persecute Jews, Muslims, or even people of non-faith. What was the jurisdictional uh, boundaries of the Inquisition? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of people get confused about that and, and think, right, from these false narratives, it's the church going out and attacking Jews and Christian or Jews and Muslims and other non-Christian or non-Catholic groups. And and that's not the case, right? It's it's the, the jurisdiction of the Inquisition was over baptized Christians because of what we mentioned earlier in the show, what the definition of heresy actually is, right? It's a it's a um, an obstinate post-baptismal denial of a doctrine of faith. So one has to be baptized, so be a Christian, in order to then enter into heresy. So a Jew, a practicing Jew, a practicing Muslim, a Hindu, whatever, uh, it, you know, cannot technically be considered or legally be considered uh, a heretic. Mm-hmm. And so the church had no ju- the Inquisition had no jurisdictions over those people and their beliefs. I wonder if the other faiths had something similar, too, or if it's just a Christian well, No, faith one and... of the things that has always struck me uh, was the, the persecutions of the Japanese Catholics. And they f- absolutely had an Inquisition system there. Sure. They were weeding out Catholics. They were using the Fumi stones. They were using these methods to get them to step on an image of Jesus or uh, whatever, right? And that there was... I would say that the Japanese persecution of Catholics is much more in line with the popular concept of how the Inquisition went right. than actual, the real Inquisition the real in the Inquisition West. Was exactly. I mean, they were torturing people. Mm-hmm. They were executing people at random. There was no rule of law. Mm-hmm. And it was specifically the punishment was death for being a Christian. Whereas in the West, in the real Inquisition, it was a much more structured system so I, you know, well, one was designed to eradicate the faith, exactly. right? The other was designed to, as an act of charity, to help one who had fallen into error and place their soul in the state of danger, eternal danger, to recant, repent, and reconcile, and to be back into the bosom of the church in order so that, you know, God willing, they would be able to enjoy the beatific vision. I mean, there's mm-hmm. this distinct difference in purpose, uh, not not to mention procedure and structure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, a sense of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes observing Jesus closely. Like there's a direct quote from scripture that they're observing him so closely that there's a, there's a literal tie that we could look at the church being observed so closely because it's the continuation of the perfect deposit of faith and the practice of faith in the person of Jesus Christ and entrusted to the apostolic church as the apostolic deposit that we continue to root our succession in. And I think there's a a sense of, yes, we do need to have canon law governing what we do. We need to look at the history, strictly speaking, and we we must see that. Look, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were observing Jesus closely and spinning off all of these different untruths about his ministry, we have to kind of expect that in the same practice of the of the mystical body of Christ, the church throughout its history. And I think the Inquisition is a perfect example of that. I think the Crusades is another perfect example of that. So even in our own lives, you know, look at how we treat our pop stars and our and the people in in political government or, or people in authority or our priests or the bishops or whatever. It's like we, we're observing everybody so closely to find the imperfection and and to say this person is not perfect, and and it's like, what is the execution of 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 uh, the realities of that consequence? Mm. You know, and we have to rely on the person of Jesus Christ and the mystical body of His Church and the orthodoxy contained within her that we must constantly return to in this process of inquisition, I think, you know, and self-analysis, self-awareness, examine, you know, that examine of 
who we are, responding to that that uh, you know that that drive of Saint Augustine expressing Christian, know thyself. We should know who we are as Catholics. And I just so appreciate your expertise and really coloring in a lot of the Inquisition for me. This is like history in in the seminary. It's yeah, excellent. That's a good way to wrap it up, though. I think yeah. you really hit it there. Yeah. Even though that was a really excellent answer, and I think you really summed up the episode well. Uh, this is an episode on the Inquisition, so there is no way that I, in good conscience, could ever let you get away with not having an Inquisition question in this episode. I'm not but, surprised. But in my mercy, I will give you a brief reprieve. Mercy? Uh, Riot Shield yeah. and mercy? Well, don't, don't, don't go getting too excited. It's not very merciful. Uh, <laughs> but before I do that, I'll give you a little reprieve, and I'll give you time to tell everyone how they can follow us and learn more about the things that they can get involved with. Well, can I know the no. question before I do that so then Absolutely I can be stewing not. on it? No, you cannot. So you're really not being merciful at all. <laughs> exactly. That's why <laughs> you're I just you forcing not to... me and subjugating me to, to do yeah, what I'm you keeping want. the civil order so this show there runs well. <laughs> <laughs> No one understands. So if you want to be an inquisitor at home and find out what type of content we have out there in the internet, be sure to visit us at catholictalkshow.com. On that website, you'll be able to subscribe and see all of the platforms that we have available to you so you can listen in or view. So if you continue to journey with us and continue to be that good inquisitor to really uncover the materials that we have out there, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And certainly support us as we continue to bring great guests like Steve onto the show. Become a patron of ours. Go to patreon.com forward slash the Catholic talk show. And finally, just again, we've given a shout out to Exodus 90 as well as Covenant Eyes, these wonderful sponsors who are partnering with us on this wonderful endeavor. So we thank them for their support and please support them. So check out Exodus 90. They have a great application on all the iOS and Android platforms right. as well as Covenant Eyes. If you go to Covenant Eyes, you can actually get a nice percentage off of their well, yeah. product. You get 30 days free if you go to Covenant Eyes and use the promo code Catholic Talk. So be sure to use that promo code Catholic Talk to get 30 days free of Covenant Eyes. And again, we journey together in our faith. We help reprove ourself and our sense of orthodoxy and our teachings. And now I will be challenged. You will be. You'll be in inquired and then <laughs> we're going to go through the inquisitorial process <laughs> inquisitorial. so one thing i do want to say is if you're watching this on youtube there's a button i don't know here, here, here somewhere here. here subscribe right and then click the little bell icon that every time we release a new episode you'll get notified so that's a really easy way to make sure that you're seeing our videos i'm gonna do that now <laughs> okay. you do that now no, you're me gonna and be checking him, the scores i know you man because <laughs> me and him we are going into our version of the Inquisition. I'm Excellent. super nervous. Now it's the both of you guys? No, I saw no, you no, whispering no, over there. Whispering, he, no, he, no, no, he's no. going to be... I'm an impartial he's, observer. He's remanded me to... <laughs> yes. He's remanded you to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, you had your time before yes. the church, yeah. He was trying to be merciful, but you're obstinate. Actually, no, I'm going to put you in the scenario where you are not the person on, on the rack. Right, you are not the one being. Oh, you are actually the inquisitor himself. Oh, oh well, you know me already. Yeah, you're a mush pot. I am a mush pot. But... You are going through a case with somebody, and you are in the Spanish Inquisition. You're probably a Dominican, right? They're probably obstinate in their heresy. And you're going through the case with them, and you demand them to say, do you, re do you repent of this heresy? Do and they say, I do. And then you ask to confirm it. Are you telling the truth? And the person who you are inquiring says, I always lie. How do you rule in this case was he telling the truth because he says he always lies and he says he always lies yes now first and foremost can i have clarification on the heresy itself like that dogs don't go to heaven or what, what kind of Ooh. i'm a dominican mm. let's not get into that um <laughs> this particular person likes to put pineapple in pizza oh. Oh. <laughs> i'm already in favor of course you are <laughs> so if the person that you are um interrogating then says, I always lie. Mm. Are they telling the truth or not? Well, clearly stated, no. No? Yeah. So if... But if they're lying and they say they always lie, wouldn't they the, the phrase that they always lie be a lie, which means they're telling the truth? <laughs> Touche. There's like some sort of infinite loop there. Yeah, there's a loop there. You know? <laughs> well, answer the question. Is there, a boulder? <laughs> is, there, is there a boulder that God created that he could not lift? 
We're not getting into that. And also, we got into that in another episode <laughs> yeah, we did. where if Jesus could hit the perfect curveball, yes. if he could throw a curveball so perfect that he himself could not hit it. <laughs> Let's not go and back there. your answer there. was wrong. Let's, Let's not go back there. My answer was right. Was Joe Boo. Wasn't Joe Boo the one that could hit the curveball? No. <laughs> Boo. He Joe Boo. Yeah, he could. Yeah. <laughs> so, if your person that you're, um, you know, hmm. you're giving them the inquisition, the inquisition. I may need uh, weeks of, of, you know, inquiring and... You know, just to, to put all that pizza. all together. Okay. Yeah. If all they that say they repent the and they are now no longer a heretic and they will mm -hmm. follow and they say, and you say, is this a confirmed statement? And they say, I always lie. How do you take that? What's your ruling, <laughs> magistrate? <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> One, I would not be a Dominican. Two. <laughs> well, they wouldn't have you. <laughs> they wouldn't have me. <laughs> it's a yes or no um, question. If they say they always lie, they are always they telling lie. the truth or are they lying? They always lie. They're, and then in that statement, it's a true statement. Is it? Because if they always lie, that statement's false. <laughs> Dude. You need some more coffee? I, I need more coffee. I got no sleep last night. Um, I, would, I, I guess I would say that I would, I would lean in the direction of my impression. I would, I would question... You got no answer. The yes, I mean, Sheik, no, you're done. He's either a liar or he's not. You're well, done. granted, it's we the Inquisition an and I fail. No, it's a paradox. You're off to now the... There's no, you are, the, there's no now, right... There's no right... How can I right. answer that? If, if right. I was the King of Spain, I would send you off to Guyana right now to work on the Inquisition <laughs> there. Work your chops back up before that's you right. come back into the Major League. the Miners, that's right. Yeah, yeah. you go to the Miners. <laughs> We're putting you in the bullpen. Yeah, you're no good. <laughs> I think this is an example of a hard fail. But yes. in, in all fairness, it's a paradox. There's no way to there's answer no, there's it. There's no way to answer it. There's an infinite loop. Yeah, so... Well, thanks oh, hey, a lot. Uh, we really want to thank you uh, for coming on the uh, yeah. episode again. Yeah. Um, everyone out there, if you go to our Sunday Visitor, his uh, latest book, Timeless, it's a history of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. It's available on there. It's a very, very in-depth book. And I, there's a, a lot of other great books out there as well, uh, books on the Inquisition, books mm -hmm. on the Crusade. Yep. Um, yeah. Thanks again for coming. We thank really you. appreciate yeah. it. It was yeah. tremendous having thank you. Thank you. If I could just say, you can learn more about my books and things like that at my website. It's uh, just stevewidenkoff.com. All one word. So I'll make sure we'll I put that, that link in there. That. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you guys yeah. for having me so on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, yeah, thank you, you for it. joining us once again, and we'll see you next week. God bless. Yeah.